if you're a person of faith, you have to rest assured that in all the darkness and craziness and the stuff that you will never comprehend, God has the ultimate plan. We just have to believe that and wait for that. Welcome to the Christian Music Archive podcast, conversations about Christ, community, and music. I'm your host, Dave Maurer. Each week, I am privileged to chat with a musical guest who is listed on the pages of the Christian Music Archive. There are thousands of creative men and women who have helped shape the soundtrack of the Christian faith, and we get to hear their stories, learn about how Christ has made a difference in their life, and Hopefully along the way, we'll learn how we can be a better part of our community. Before we launch into my conversation with Michael Sweet today, I wanted to give a shout out to my new friend, Greg Johnston. Greg is the chaplain for the Christian Motorcycle Association chapter in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Greg has a couple of master's degrees and works for a large software company, so you know he's a really smart guy. And he's also a rock enthusiast and likes listening to Bloodgood, White Cross, and Striper, to name a few. So why am I talking about Greg today? Greg is one of the patrons that helps support the Christian Music Archive. Each month, he throws a little love our way to help cover the cost of producing this podcast. And I sure couldn't do it without the support and encouragement of Greg and folks like him. Would you like to join Greg in supporting the Christian Music Archive podcast? It's really, really easy. Just jump over to patreon.com slash ccmexchange and sign up. Oh, and by the way, if you listen closely during my conversation with Michael Sweet today, one of the questions I ask is something that Greg wanted to know. I'd love to ask my guests questions that are on your mind too, and you can do that over at Patreon. So, be really smart like Greg and go to patreon.com slash ccmexchange. I'll put the link in our show notes for you to reference later on. Hey, Greg, thanks for your support. I really appreciate you. Back at the end of 2020, I got to sit down with Michael Sweet, you know, the lead singer of Striper, part of the duo Sweet and Lynch, and solo artist Michael Sweet. <laughs> yeah, that guy. For those who may not be familiar with Michael, here's a quick rundown. He's released eight solo albums. He was the lead singer of the rock band Boston for four years. And he is a founding member of the band Striper, along with his brother Robert and friend Oz Fox. Striper has sold more than 10 million albums and were a pioneer in the Christian metal industry when it was just getting started back in the early 80s. During our interview, you'll hear him mention that he has another six projects that he's working on for the first couple of months of 2021. Six projects! <laughs> you can tell Michael is a really busy guy, and I'm super honored that he would take some time to chat with us today. So let's jump right in to the conversation with Michael Sweet. I want to welcome you to the podcast, Michael. Uh, we have a lot of stuff to talk about today. You've got a bunch of solo albums that you've got out. Obviously, your time with Striper, and you've got uh, music with your buddy George Lynch. Uh, I'm excited to get to know a little bit more about what's going on with you. So welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, buddy. It's great to be here. Yeah, there's a lot going on. It's interesting for me, anyway, at least at this particular time. Um, it really does seem and feel busier for me right now than it did a year ago or two years ago or three years ago. I mean, this, this year in particular, 2020 has been probably one of the, the busiest years of my life. And I'm, I'm serious when I say that. And it's just crazy to be able to say. Well, let's go back a little bit. You've been an outspoken Christian musician since the early eighties when you and your brother started Striper. Um, when you first decided to be a rock star was making music about Jesus. Was, was that always the plan? It wasn't. I mean, when we first started, uh, I was 12 when I joined my brother's band. We started gigging when I was 13. And uh, from 13 to 20, I uh, knew about God, went to church for a brief moment in time and, and dedicated my life to God, uh, it, you know, became a Christian, said the sinner's prayer in front of a television, watching uh, Jimmy Swagger. But it wasn't rooted. 
it wasn't something that really took root um, and grew and flourished until I was 20. And that's when I rededicated my life and became very serious about my faith and my walk. Uh, but between 13 and 20, I did all that uh, typical cliche rock and roll lifestyle stuff. Yeah. Got it out of my system. I grew up fast. I did a lot of a lot of partying and a lot of things. And and I made the decision with my brother when I was 20. He was 23 to walk away from that and to uh, start a new journey. And here, here I am speaking to you 37 years later. <laughs> crazy, crazy. Well, I, I firmly believe that everyone who has an encounter with Christ has a change in their trajectory and things, their life is different. Would you mind sharing your testimony and how it was that that shaped you both personally and professionally? Well, when I, when I gave my heart to Christ, when I was uh, basically again, 12 years old, right. uh, and, I, and I gave my heart to Christ, uh, it was real. I mean, I, I, I wanted nothing more than to devote my time to Christ. And we got connected into a church, became part of the worship group and, uh, loved going to church, loved reading the Bible, loved growing. But because I was so young, I think for me personally, it wasn't the right time for me to get serious about my faith. Mm. Uh, I kind of had to go through what I went through to be the man that I am today. And, you know, I, I was arrested. I talk about that in my book. Uh, you know, for my brother was driving down Beach Boulevard, honking the horn, I'm mooning cars, you know, and <laughs> it's it's kind of comical and laughable and something I'm sure a lot of kids have done. But, you know, I got arrested for it. And a number of things happened in my life during that time that it really started to uh, mold me mm -hmm. and, and, and show me where I was supposed to go from there. OK. So, you know, it was really cool how that worked out. And then when I when I turned 20, that's when it, it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I decided, you know what? That's it. I'm turning everything around. I'm dedicating my life. Um, I'm going to uh, sing and, and play and write for Jesus and no, no looking back. So was there a specific incident when you were 20 or was it just the kind of the accumulation of stuff that you'd experienced over the past eight years? It was both the accumulation of stuff. And, and going through hardships and having uh, a friend in particular by the name of Kenny Metcalf, who was in the world and became a Christian. And he came to a rehearsal and started basically preaching to us hmm. and telling us what we already knew. You know, if you give the band to God, he's going to use you and take you places unknown and unheard of. And we already knew this. We were sitting there thinking, this sounds all too familiar. <laughs> right. We heard it before through Jimmy Swagger and church and uh, Arthur Blessed Ministries on Sunset Boulevard and, you know, over and over again. And when he came in and said it and we saw the look in his eyes and how his life had been transformed, it made us want to, you know, get serious with God uh, once and for all. I find it interesting a lot of times as we hear from God in a number of different ways that sometimes it's that personal relationship that somebody has with us that causes us to kind of go over the edge and say, okay, yeah, I need to do this for real, not just what a preacher says or not just what we hear in church, but it's that personal relationship kind of a thing. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And you connect with that. I mean, we could relate to Kenny. He's a musician. Yeah. Uh, you know, we performed with him and grew up around town with him and hearing his stories and he heard our stories and it, there was a relatable source there, you know, and, and when he came in and was speaking to us, we, we, our ears were, were more open than the local pastor speaking to us. So you hung, you hung up the old ways and you started the new ways. That was Striper, right? At the time, not officially Striper yet. That's when we were we were still called Rock's Regime. Right. Okay. And we uh, we basically dedicated our lives. I rewrote the lyrics. Uh, you know, loud and clear had a line in it in it about drinking beer and you know uh -huh. uh, things like that. And I rewrote the lyrics to those songs, and we started basically having open rehearsals. And we would perform these new uh, recomposed lyrics. And then after the sh after the rehearsal, hour long set or whatever, we'd have a guy by the name of Michael Guido preach. Ah. 
and we would invite 10 people and then then 20 and then it was a two car garage and the band was <laughs> in the corner and we had like 50 people crammed in there and oh, it was wow. a sweat box yeah so what we started doing it was a uh, a sealed uh soundproof garage where the door never opened and we basically uh readjusted some things and started opening the door and we had kids in the driveway and even cop cars out in front wow and we would be singing and preaching to 100 to 200 people at a time so i would imagine that as you guys uh kind of transitioned to striper and there was there was the temptation of how do we reach the most amount of people but also how do we sell records to make ourselves viable you guys chose a style of music that wasn't popular in Christian circles at the time. Was that intentional? Well, I mean, we didn't, to be honest with you, sit down and devise a plan. We didn't have a strategy. We just, we stayed true to who we were and are. Gotcha. We just did what we, what we do. You know, we played the kind of music that we love and yeah. grew up on. We grew up on Judas Priest, Van Halen, Iron Maiden. And that's, that's where we learned how to play and write and perform. So that's what we continue doing. And we had our look. Uh, nobody in the Christian community knew what to think of us. They thought we were, they thought we were evil, you know? Yeah. And uh, who is this? Who is this band? What is this? This is crazy. And uh, it didn't stop us from doing what we felt called to do. And uh, it was, a, it, it is, it was, and is a very powerful ministry. I mean, we've seen so many lives affected and changed uh, for the good through the ministry of Striper. Yeah. Well, I would imagine, I mean, like you said, it's been 30 plus 37 years, whatever. You've probably had some pretty amazing stories of how God has worked through your music and your ministry. Would you have one or two of those that you could share that just really stand out in your mind? Well, I mean, many stories of people like after a show, you know, we would go out after the show back in those days because you could do this. And, you know, we'd walk up on the stage when most of the people are clearing the venue and there might be two or three hundred people left. And we'd call them up to the, uh, the, the, the around the stage and, and we'd sit there and talk and pray with them and and, uh, and basically, you know, tell them about God. Mm hmm. And many times, uh, you know, we experience a number of things where there were guys in the in that crowd that were, uh, you know, Satanist and, and they were slurring and praying against us and all kinds of crazy stuff going on. We had drug addicts that would literally pull out their drugs right in front of us and throw them in the trash can. Wow. And I mean, like needles, you know, we witnessed a lot of stuff that would raise the hairs on your arm. Uh, over the years, in time and time again, and still do. And this is because you guys are willing to reach out to a section of society that a lot of times I think the church kind of tries to ignore. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's a fine line. It's tricky because we're a ministry, but we're a business. Right. So some people would scratch their heads and say, huh? How does that work? <laughs> right. But I mean, this is what we do for a living. Yeah. You know, this is all we do. I don't work at Home Depot. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, I, I make music and it's 24 seven. And, and unfortunately, uh, sometimes it doesn't it's hard to pay the bills with music, especially these days. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that's why we have to charge for do, making an album we have to charge for a show and we have to charge and some people expect us to because we are a ministry to do it all for free but you know that's been the toughest part through the years 37 years is trying to uh distinguish the two and and you know separate the two yeah uh but it's worked we figured out a way to do it i think and you know, we're always fair about what we charge. And uh, at the same time, we never lose sight or vision of, of what we're there to do. We're there to share, share the gospel. Uh, and, and we do. And you have built a very, very solid following, a very um, rabid fan base, both in and outside of the Christian circles. Um, and I've got a guy in our church who uh, eats, lives, and breathes your music, and uh, and we have a patron, somebody who supports our podcast, and he wanted me to ask, you guys have had some transitions over over the period of th the last 37 years of different people coming in and out, 
And Greg wanted me to be sure and say, hey, you guys are making the best music of your career by right now, but what is it like to have this kind of rotating people in and out of the band? Well, it's really only been one person. There's been no rotation with my brother or with Oz. Yeah, you and you three are kind of the core, right? Yeah, there's only been one person. Uh, it's been a kind of a, a rotating uh, door or however you want to say that. Uh, and we decided to, uh, you know, a few years ago in 2016, we decided to kind of stop that door from rotating. Mm. And we put an end to it. And we, what I mean by that is we, uh, for the last time, you know, we parted ways with our former bassist and we, we um, brought Perry Richardson into the band. Right. And he's really been a godsend and a blessing to the band and love having him. And he's very happy here. He's very respectful and he's just thrilled to be here. And, and we love having him. He's got a big smile on his face all the time and it makes us smile. That's very cool. Very cool. And and how did you guys get hooked up with Perry? Well, you know, we were looking for bass players. We were talking about throwing names out there. Rudy Sarzo was one of them and um, uh, James Lomenzo, a couple other bass players. And uh, we, Sean McNabb was one that was actually almost in the band. We were moving forward with that. And then Perry's name came up and we wound up meeting with Perry, talking with him first and meeting with him. And we just fell in love with his spirit. And, you know, obviously he's a great, talented bass sure. player, great yeah. singer. And a, a perfect fit for us, like perfect. Uh, it's very cool how God brings the right people in at the right time, isn't it? It really is. And I've even gone as far as to say, and some people get up in arms when I say this, but, you know, I I, I, I kind of scratched my head and it, it's hard for me to understand why we didn't meet Perry back in 1983. <laughs> right. and, and that's, I mean... It, 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 there are reasons why we go through what we go through and we learn and we live and we grow and it, 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 all that kind of stuff. We all know that. But at the same time, uh, you know, he's such a such a great fit. We just kind of th- we all talk about it and joke about it like, man, where were you in 83? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, apparently he was going through stuff and learning and living and we were going through stuff and learning and living. And, and here we are. Well, you talked about uh, about challenges and things that you have to go through to grow. You had a very public uh, business kind of fallout at one point in your life, and I don't need to go into the details of all of that. But um, how do those how do those focus and shift your your ministry? Because I can imagine that those would be places where you say, "Well, let's just throw in the towel and call it quits," because it's just not worth it. Well, when you say the public, uh, are you talking about uh, the bankruptcy itself? Yeah, all the the misappropriation by your management and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, basically, you live and learn. Again, we, you know, when you're a musician, nine times out of ten, you're not really caught up in or caring about the business side of things. Hmm. You're, you're more involved in the musical side of things, as it should be. But you also have to be tapped in and tied into the the finances and know what's going on so you don't wind up bankrupt someday, as we did. And it's funny because, interestingly enough, you go down the list of music uh, and musicians and artists, and probably 75% of artists have been bankrupt in their lives, Hmm. you know, uh, or if not on paper, you know, no money in the bank, you know, yeah. the starving musician cliche and <laughs> right. eating beans from a can and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's true. If you're, if you're not keeping tabs on, on the financial side and we, we, we started keeping tabs on it once we went through that ordeal of bankruptcy and we weren't a corporation, we were partnerships. So we had to all uh, as partners file. Mm-hmm. And I didn't have to, according to my bank account, but I had to, according to the partnership. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I learned a lot from that. Um, it was one of the reasons, not the reason, but one of the reasons why I left the band. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm fine talking about all this stuff. I'm an open book, man. Uh, some people say I shouldn't be as open as I am, but it's just how I'm built. Uh <laughs> Yeah, it's one of the reasons why I left the band, because to be honest with you, I wanted to get my life in order. I wanted to get my my uh, spiritual life in order, my family life in order and my financial life in order. Yeah. And I didn't feel I could do that staying in Striper. So what caused you to come back? 
Well, I mean, I, I got my life in order and I started feeling like I was in a good place. That's fast forwarding to 2002. Right. I left in 92. So that's 10 years later. And, uh, you know, I, I just took time, spent it with my family, made that my priority. I got involved in the church, led worship, made that my priority. Uh, and I felt like I was putting, you know, my priorities in order. God first, family second, and everything else will fall into place. That's what I was trying to do for 10 years. And yeah. in 02, we started talking about, you know, maybe getting back together. And I played my reborn demo for Oz and Robert. They loved it. We, we decided to reform, make it a Striper album. And um, excuse me, that was in 04. I played that for them. Okay. Uh, and then we released it in 05 and officially relaunched the second chapter of Striper. But I felt like I, I always said to the guys, <clears throat> I was very upfront about it. And, and some fans will think uh, I'm not a nice person for putting it to them like this. But you know what? I had to because I had nothing to lose. I, I could have just continued on with my life mm -hmm. and been fine. Releasing solo music and working at the campground, Cranberry Bogs and no problem. But I basically told the guys, I said, the only way I would do it is if everything's restructured and you know we start a new corporation and you know we're going to have a manager and i'm going to be kind of steering the ship or driving the train or whatever way you want to put it and right. they agreed to that now i basically i would not have done it if it was any other way you're just trying to make sure you weren't able to repeat the errors of the of the previous lessons that you'd learned so to speak Exactly. Yeah. I did not want to repeat one thing. <laughs> I wanted to grow and learn and expand and, and not go back to the old habits and old styles. And it, to this day, that's still the philosophy. Um, you know, we we're very fair. Everything's split up. Super fair. If the books were ever opened, I mean, everything is it, it, everyone gets the same. Uh, there's there's nothing shady going on here. But at the same time. Uh, you know, Lisa and Dave Rose man. Lisa's my wife. They, uh, Lisa and Dave Rose manage the band, and I kind of, I kind of lead the projects. And uh, you know, it's just the way that it has to be, and um, the only way that it can work. Well, I know the perception from a lot of fans was, you know, when your chapter with Striper came to an end, you you came out solo. And then you came back at the end uh, and we regrouped Striper again, yet you're still making solo stuff. So how, how do you decide what's going to be a solo project or what's going to be a partner project with George Lynch or what's going to be a Striper project? You know, I don't think about it. Oh, really? I don't. No, nope, I just when, when it's time to do an album, I just start writing. OK. And I think I think subconsciously it kind of works out. Uh, but I don't have a format or I don't sit down and say, okay, these have to sound like Michael Sweet. This has to sound like Sweet Lynch. There's always going to be similarities. Like I've heard people say Promise Land from Sweet Lynch sounds like Striper. Right. Uh, I heard people say Only the Rise sounds like Striper. I'm like, well, that's funny. George wrote that. <laughs> so yeah. apparently George has a Striper fascination. There you go. Which he does not. <laughs> <laughs> So it's really comical to hear some of the comments. It's, yeah. it, it's, it's like, apparently the minute I sing on any song, it's going to sound like Striper. Well, and you have that with a lot of, you know, I mean, I think of Greg Voles when he left Petra and went solo. There was still that feeling of, well, this is really what Petra sounds like. You know, there's there's kind of that, the lead vocalist is the sound of the band. And I think that's even more so with uh, vocalists that have a really, like it or not, a really unique voice. Yeah. And I'm not saying I, I'm, I'm not patting myself on the shoulder and saying I'm great at all. I'm not, I, I think I suck, but I'm just saying I have a very unusual voice. Yeah. Yeah. It's and it's not very like, it doesn't really sound like anyone else from the eighties. You know, we were all hitting high notes and everything, but you know, I, I just have a particular sounding voice. And I think once you hear it, love it or hate it, you know, it's me. Yeah. And so people just automatically assume, oh, this is a striper because that's their first impression of who you were. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They hear me sing. You know, I could sing, uh, you know, um, you pick a song. I mean, a, a nursery, nursery <laughs> rhyme. 
and, and people would say, that sounds just like Striper. Yeah, I that's mean, crazy. It, it's really funny. It, it Honestly, it's funny sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you just, you briefly mentioned a little bit ago that you, you know, you, when you took some time off, you went home and you worked, you, you worked with your family. Things came back together. Life was looking from the outside anyway, like things were going well. But you had a, a struggle in 2009 when your first wife passed away after cancer. I did. How did that experience shape your music? I did. I, honestly, I don't know how we all got through that because it was it was really the darkest time of our lives, obviously. And you know, our world came crashing in and, and, you know, questioning God, angry at God, uh, wondering what's going on here. This makes no sense at all. And, and then to throw into that, me going out and touring right in the middle of that with Boston, yeah, which made no sense at all. But Kyle insisted that I do it and really got behind me and supported me and made me want to do it because of that. Mm-hmm. But I was against doing it uh, initially when, when I got word uh, about d- they wanted me to join the band and go out and do the tour. I, I talked with Kyle and I was very hesitant and I thought, no, no, this can't work. I'm your caretaker, you know, yeah. it, that, that's just not going to work. But I did go out and do that. I was gone. I was for three months. And, you know, it, my, my daughter was her caretaker during that time. And it was a really, really tough time. But at the same time, um, Somehow, I think it uh, it strengthened us, hmm. if, if that makes any sense. How, how would you say that? I mean, what what? How would you demonstrate that? Well, it strengthened our relationships. It strengthened our faith, even though there was turmoil. Even though we were all kind of trying to find ourselves. So, in other words, like my son moved out for a while. Because we, we were all running from it, but at the same time, we were all in the storm together, yeah. facing it, and just trying to run and, you know, and figure it out. But I think in the end, it, it made us all stronger. So in other words, right now, today, our relationships are stronger, uh, and you know, we've been able to grow out of it and from it. Yeah. What do you say to somebody who is going right now through the darkness of losing a spouse, losing a loved one, and where you feel like everything is over, you want to crawl up into a fetal position and just ignore the world? You're looking at it from the perspective of, you know, 10 years later, the the, the path that led you to where you are now. But what do you say to somebody who's going through that right now? Well, when you're in the storm and it's dark, and you can't see your hand in front of your face, you have to somehow from the depths of your soul, always remind yourself that the sun will break through again. You know, the sun's going to, the clouds are going to part, the storm's going to pass and the sun's, the sun is going to shine. And it might take longer for some people. Uh, You know, I tell you, coming out of that, it was not easy. You know, and, and going through it was not easy. It it was at at times I felt like yeah, I, you know we weren't going to make it through. Yeah. As a, as a family, but you just you know if you're a person of faith, you have to rest assured that in all the darkness and craziness and the stuff that you will never comprehend, God has the ultimate plan. Yeah. And we, we just have to believe that and wait for that. Was that something that you were able to rationalize yourself or did you have to have people speak that into your life during that time? I had people speak that into my life during that time too. Uh, a few different pastors. And um, I, I also had uh, friends, a group of friends that, you know, turned their backs on me because I did, I, I decided to keep moving forward. So a few days after the, the funeral, you know, I booked a striper tour. And, you know, I chose not to stay in my bedroom yeah. and close, close the door. I chose to keep living and, and keep moving. 
booked a stripe or two. I wound up meeting someone and dating someone relatively soon afterwards. We're married to this day. We've been, we're going on 11 years of marriage. Yeah. And I lost a lot of friends through that. Because what happens when something like that, when you go through something like that, you, you, you will discover who your true friends are. Mm-hmm. And who you who are not your friends, and and it's an eye opener. Yeah, it's a real eye opener because you you need as much support as you can get when you're going through something like that. And when you know someone that you've known for ten years or twenty years or thirty years turns their back on you because they think you're you know betraying your your um, your former wife or what for moving on so soon or what have you, you know, whatever the circumstances yeah. it's, it's, it's really disheartening. And I went through a period of a good year, year and a half, and I still have some things that I hold on to. I'm trying to let go of uh, that as a human being are hard to comprehend and understand how people could, uh, you know, turn their backs on someone going through something like that, having not gone through it themselves. Yeah. You know, we're so quick to judge and we don't even have the slightest clue about yeah. the situation. Yeah. I would imagine that probably made the whole process of losing your wife almost more difficult is losing the friends that were so-called friends, I guess. It, it did. But at, in, in retrospect and hindsight, when I look back on it, I'm glad that it happened that way. And what I mean by that is it showed me who I'm supposed to associate with. Uh, And that's not everyone. So it was kind of the chaff process, weeding the chaff out from the wheat for you in your friend list. Absolutely. And I'm okay with that now. At the time I wasn't, I'm okay with that now. Yeah. And I still think of those people and pray for those people. But you know what? God God will deal with them and God will deal with me. Well, in all of those situations, the death of your wife, the, the loss of friends, the business bankruptcy, those are all forming you and molding you into who you are today. And like you said at the top of our interview, you're busier now than you were for, have been for a long, long time, if maybe ever. And I find that a lot of times out of these dark times, out of the difficulties, God uses those to actually build us and prepare us for the future. So what kinds of projects are you working on now that are kind of the outgrowth of that experience and, and moving forward? Yeah, it's it's unbelievable. I mean, there, and, and part of that's due to not only me being blessed by God with many opportunities, but also my personality is to take on as many opportunities as I can. <laughs> I hear that. And I, and I can drive people crazy in the process because my wife and management are saying, please don't take on another project because <laughs> we're dealing with four of your projects right now. Yeah. And we can't deal with it anymore. And, you know, I'm just that, that kind of guy. Yeah. Uh, you know, you got to slow me down and, and keep a, keep a tight, tight leash on me, man. But, um, you know, I'm very blessed to have opportunities this year. I've done a lot this year with Striper, with Sun Mom, uh, working on other songs for other people. And then next year, uh, starting in January, I've got uh, five projects five. that I'm, reco- I'm recording. Five projects. Uh, and that's albums, five albums. And then I have the live striper event. We're going to do again, two full albums. Very cool. We're going to shoot that sometime in maybe May or June. And we've got an acoustic album that we have in the can that's coming out. We've got the to hell with the devil live at spirit house. It's already done. That'll be coming out probably February or March. Wow. Uh, We got a lot going on, man. And it's, I'm very blessed during the pandemic to have work. Well, and I was just going to ask, do you think that you're busier because of the pandemic, because you have more time, or is that just a coincidence that those happened at the same time? I think that's partially true, but I also think that maybe because of the pandemic and the mentality of, oh, crud, (laughs) uh, I got to keep work going. You know, I'm piling on extra work. Yeah. So it's a combination of all of the above. I mean, I'm very super blessed and very fortunate to have a number of labels to work with. Yeah. 
So most bands have one label or no label. Yeah. I have three different labels that I work with. And, you know, it's really, I tell you, I count my blessings because it's unheard of. And then I'm, I, I'm planning on doing a worship album and working with another label. Wow. So then it would take, I'd go into the four label uh, territory. And, <laughs> you know, the fact that people want to work with me, here I am, this 57 year old nobody, and people want to work with me is mind boggling to me. And I'm just blessed to be able to still do what I love. Well, that's that's great. I I am so looking forward to hearing some of these projects that are coming out. And uh, if people want to find out or stay in touch with you to be able to get that information when those release, what's the best way for them to to hear from you? Well, they can. Um, I'm really active on Facebook, and that's the Michael Sweet. Uh, I'm really active on Instagram, Michael Sweet Striper, and uh, active on Twitter, of course, and. Uh, I have a web page, michaelsweet.com. And then, of course, there's all the Striper pages as well. And I'm super active on all those. I'm always posting on all of them every day uh, and trying to make people laugh or post uh, a prayer or post serious uh, information or keep people up to date or whatever it is. I'm always trying to keep uh, all the friends and fans involved and engaged. That, that's a full-time job in and of itself. <laughs> it, honestly, it really is. I mean, we launched we launched a live Christmas show. I have a uh, live stream and um, we uh, I spent maybe four, at least four hours of the day uh, just basically posting stuff. Yeah. Posting and engaging and uh, commenting back and whatnot. And it's like it, it's a full time job, man. You know? Yeah. Well, so when do you sleep? Maybe that's the question we should ask. <laughs> I sleep. I, I usually go to bed about, you know, midnight and sleep till seven or so, so <laughs> three or seven. So I definitely get to sleep. But uh, boy, it, it sure seems like a little less these days, which is fine. I don't I don't mind that at all. When we get back out on a bus and start touring again, I'll sleep. I'll get back into that eight or nine hour sleep mode. One of the things that we do uh, every Saturday, we send out a prayer newsletter to a bunch of people who've committed to praying for artists that are active. And, and how can we be praying for you and the guys in the upcoming weeks and months ahead? Well, we just appreciate uh, guidance, prayers for guidance, for um, opportunities, you know, a way for Striper to keep moving forward as a ministry and as a band um, in, in the pandemic. Obviously, we're not touring, and that was really the way that we did survive mm -hmm. uh, as a brand. And now we're not touring at all, so that's been cut. And you know, we're trying to figure out creative ways to uh, to stay focused on what we're here to do. So we appreciate prayers for that. Just that uh, God would keep bringing us opportunities, and that we would be able to stay healthy, and. Uh, you know, continue doing what we're doing because this is really a powerful ministry that's touched a lot of people over the years. A lot of times we think that following God makes everything easy, or at least that's what we want to believe. But that's not really what Jesus says. In Deuteronomy 31.6, God says not to be afraid, for God will personally go ahead of you. He will not abandon you. But he doesn't say that he'll take the problems away. In Matthew, Jesus said that following him means to take up his yoke. Now, a yoke is something that you put on an oxen to help pull a heavy cart. That doesn't sound easy. <laughs> Nowhere in the Bible have I found it say that believing in Jesus makes all of our troubles go away. Now, we heard this in Michael's story today. Striper had to declare bankruptcy because of some financial misdealings by a manager. Not easy. Michael lost his wife to cancer. Again, not easy. And Striper was shunned by the Christian industry for being metal. Again, not easy. But how did Michael say it? You have to rest assured that in all the darkness and craziness and the stuff that you will never comprehend, God has the ultimate plan. We just have to believe that and wait for that. 
I sure would like to encourage you today if you are going through something that you just can't handle on your own. Maybe you just lost your job because of the pandemic, or maybe you've lost a friend to cancer, or your marriage is falling apart. I'm sure some of you are dealing with things that are so awful that I can't even begin to imagine them. But I am confident of this. God loves you. He will never leave you. He'll walk with you through this tough time. And it may not make sense now, but I know that God's got a bigger plan for you. And what you are going through right now is helping shape you into the person God wants you to be. That may sound like a platitude, but it is God's promise. In the Bible, God says, I will never leave you. I will never renounce you. I'll never turn my back on you. I've got your back. As always, thanks for joining me for this conversation today. I am grateful that we get to spend this time together each week hearing stories of God's amazing faithfulness. As a regular listener to this podcast, would you mind taking a few minutes and rating it on your favorite podcast app? Reviews and ratings really help spread the word so that other folks can hear about these great conversations. And if you have comments or questions for me, please feel free to drop me a message on any of the social media platforms. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon by searching for at CCM Exchange. Or you can always drop me an email on the website, christianmusicarchive.com. I'm really looking forward to our time together next week when I have another great conversation with one of the musicians you'll find on the pages of the Christian Music Archive. So until then, remember this, God loves you. In fact, he's crazy about you. <laughs>